Robert Mitchum, who is best known for his anti-hero roles in iconic Hollywood crime dramas, has had a mysterious personal life. Ranked 23rd on the American Film Institute's list of the greatest male stars of classic American cinema, it is no surprise that Robert Mitchum has won many prestigious awards, such as the Oscar, BAFTA, and Golden Globe Cecil B. DeMille Award. However, ignoring these admirable achievements, we will give you a completely different view of Robert through his children's revelations about his personal life. Let's get started. Robert Charles Durman Mitchum, a legendary figure in Hollywood, was born on August 6, 1917, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. His roots were deeply embedded in a rich tapestry of cultural backgrounds as he hailed from a Methodist family with Scottish-Irish, Native American, and Norwegian heritage. His father, James Thomas Mitchum, played a pivotal role in shaping the family's identity. James, a diligent worker engaged in shipyard and railroad activities, possessed a lineage that intertwined Scottish-Irish and Native American roots. Anne Harriet Gunderson, Robert's mother, added the Norwegian touch to the mix, being the daughter of a sea captain. The Mitchum family expanded with the birth of Robert's older sister, Annette, who later adopted the stage name Julie Mitchum during her own acting career in the limelight. The household was further enriched when Anne became pregnant with their third child, John, who entered the world in September 1919. Tragedy struck the Mitchum family early on when James met with a fatal accident in a rail yard in Charleston, South Carolina, in February 1919. The loss was devastating, and the grief was compounded by the fact that Anne was pregnant at the time of her husband's untimely death. Despite the tragedy, Anne displayed resilience, and her strength was recognized by the government, which awarded her a pension for her husband's service. In the aftermath of the tragedy, Anne, still carrying the unborn John, made her way back to Connecticut after a brief stay in Lane, South Carolina, her late husband's hometown. The family's journey continued with the birth of John in September 1919, adding a glimmer of hope to their lives amid the shadows of loss. As the Mitchum children reached school age, Anne took on the responsibility of providing for the family, showcasing her resilience and determination. She secured employment as a linotype operator for the Bridgeport Post, displaying both her work ethic and adaptability. Life took an unexpected turn for Anne when she married Lieutenant Hugh, the Major, Cunningham Morris, a former Royal Naval Reserve officer. The union resulted in the birth of a daughter named Carol Morris around 1928, and the family found themselves resitting on a farm in Delaware. Robert, known to family and friends as a spirited prankster, developed a reputation for being mischievous and occasionally engaging in fist feats during his childhood. His youthful exuberance and spirited nature marked him as a lively presence in the community. In 1926, Anne made the decision to send Robert and his younger brother to live with her parents on a farm near Woodside, Delaware. This change in environment provided a different backdrop for the Mitchum brothers' upbringing, surrounded by the rustic charm and agricultural lifestyle of the farm. It was during this time that Robert attended Felton High School, where his mischievous tendencies led to his expulsion from the educational institution. The challenges and restlessness that characterized Mitchum's youth became more apparent during his formative years. His rebellious spirit came to the forefront when, at the age of 11, he ran away from home for the first time. This act marked the beginning of a pattern of seeking independence and adventure that would later become a defining aspect of Mitchum's persona. In 1929, Robert Mitchum and his younger brother underwent yet another shift in their upbringing. This time, they were sent to Philadelphia, to live with their older sister, Julie, who had embarked on a career as a performer in vaudeville acts along the East Coast. Julie's experience in the world of entertainment provided a unique backdrop for the Mitchum brothers as they navigated the challenges of adolescence. 
The following year saw a significant relocation for the Mitchum family as they moved to New York to join Julie. The family shared a modest apartment in Manhattan's Hell's Kitchen, a neighborhood known for its gritty urban landscape. This move marked a pivotal moment in Robert's life, exposing him to the vibrant cultural tapestry of New York City. Robert Mitchum enrolled in Heron High School, but his rebellious nature once again led to his expulsion. Undeterred by traditional educational constraints, Mitchum, at the tender age of 14, decided to venture out on his own. His journey took him across the country, where he embraced the life of a transient, hopping freight cars and taking on various jobs to sustain himself. His experiences ranged from ditch digging for the Civilian Conservation Corps to trying his hand at professional boxing. In the summer of 1933, Mitchum's wanderlust led him to Savannah, Georgia, where he found himself arrested for vagrancy and subsequently placed in a local chain gang. Undeterred by the confines of the chain gang, Mitchum managed a daring escape and hitchhiked his way to Rising Sun, Delaware, where his family had relocated. It was during this tumultuous period that fate intervened, and at the age of 16, while recovering from injuries that nearly cost him a leg, Mitchum crossed paths with a 14-year-old named Dorothy Spence. Their connection blossomed, leading to a union that would endure through the years, as Mitchum and Dorothy later married. However, the call of adventure and the allure of the unknown persisted. Mitchum soon resumed his journey, riding the rails to California, a decision that would ultimately set the stage for his remarkable journey from a vagabond youth to becoming one of Hollywood's enduring stars. In the mid-1930s, the Mitchum family underwent a significant westward migration as Julie, Robert's older sister, ventured to the West Coast with aspirations of making a mark in the movie industry. The rest of the family soon followed suit, relocating to Long Beach, California, in pursuit of new opportunities and a fresh start. Robert, with a sense of wanderlust and a desire to explore his own path, arrived in 1936. During this period, Robert Mitchum found himself immersed in an unexpected avenue, working as a ghostwriter for the renowned astrologer Carol Ryder. The role not only showcased Mitchum's versatility, but also hinted at the diverse talents he possessed beyond his eventual fame as an actor. Inspired by his sister's passion for the performing arts, Mitchum joined the local theater scene at the Players Guild of Long Beach. His early contributions were multifaceted, as he served as a stagehand and occasionally took on bit roles in company productions. This exposure to the theatrical world provided Mitchum with a platform to explore his creative instincts. In addition to his behind-the-scenes involvement, Mitchum began to express his artistic flair through writing. He penned several short pieces that were performed by the Guild, showcasing his emerging talent as a wordsmith. According to Lee Server's biography, Robert Mitchum, Baby, I Don't Care, Mitchum channeled his poetic abilities into crafting song lyrics and monologues for his sister Julie's nightclub performances. This collaborative effort not only demonstrated the close bond between the siblings, but also hinted at Mitchum's burgeoning artistic range. In 1940, Robert Mitchum made a pivotal decision to return to Delaware, where he married Dorothy Spence. After tying the knot, the couple embarked on a journey back to California to build a life together. However, the pursuit of a stable family life led Mitchum to temporarily set aside his artistic endeavors as he transitioned into the role of a devoted husband and father. The Mitchum family expanded with the arrival of their first child, James, affectionately nicknamed Josh. The responsibilities of parenthood became a central focus for Mitchum, shaping the trajectory of his personal and professional life. Two more children, Chris and Patrine, followed, cementing the Mitchums as a growing and close-knit family. To provide for his family during the challenging years of World War II, Mitchum secured steady employment as a machine operator with the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. However, the nature of the work took a toll on his health. 
The incessant noise from the machinery resulted in significant damage to Mitchum's hearing, leaving a lasting impact on his sensory abilities. The demands of wartime production, coupled with the strains of supporting a family, took a toll on Mitchum's mental well-being. The stress associated with his job reached a breaking point, leading to a nervous breakdown. This challenging period manifested in temporary vision problems for Mitchum, underscoring the profound impact that job-related stress can have on an individual's health. Following his return to California in the 1940s, Robert Mitchum set his sights on a career in film acting. Eager to make a mark in the industry, he initially took on roles as an extra and secured small speaking parts in various productions. His early efforts eventually caught the attention of Harry Sherman, the producer of Paramount's popular hopalong Cassidy Western film series, starring William Boyd. In 1942 and 1943, Mitchum was recruited to play minor villainous roles in several films within the hopalong Cassidy series. While these roles may have been modest, they provided Mitchum with valuable exposure to the workings of the film industry and allowed him to hone his craft alongside established actors. Despite being uncredited, his presence was felt in the 1943 film The Human Comedy, where he portrayed a soldier alongside Mickey Rooney. This marked an early instance of Mitchum's versatility, showcasing his ability to seamlessly blend into different roles. Mitchum's first credited role came in 1943 in the Randolph Scott War film Gung Ho, where he played a Marine private. This credit was a significant milestone in his budding career, signaling a step forward in establishing his identity as a screen actor. Undeterred by the challenges of breaking into the industry, Mitchum continued to secure work as an extra and supporting actor across various studios. His perseverance and commitment to his craft began to pay off as he gained more visibility within the competitive world of Hollywood. Robert Mitchum's breakthrough in Hollywood came after catching the eye of director Mervyn Leroy during the production of 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Impressed by Mitchum's talent and presence, Leroy facilitated a pivotal moment in Mitchum's career by helping him secure a seven-year contract with RKO Radio Pictures. As part of his early journey in the film industry, Mitchum was groomed for stardom in B-Westerns through a series of adaptations based on the works of Zane Grey. One of his notable projects during this period was the moderately successful Western film Nevada. However, Mitchum's trajectory took a significant turn when RKO lent him to United Artists for a crucial supporting role in The Story of G.I. Joe, 1945. In this acclaimed film, Mitchum portrayed the character of Bill Walker, a war-weary officer based on the real-life Captain Henry T. Waskow. The movie, narrated through the eyes of journalist Ernie Pyle, played by Burgess Meredith, depicted the trials and triumphs of an ordinary soldier during wartime. The story of G.I. Joe achieved both critical acclaim and commercial success, establishing Mitchum as a versatile and compelling actor. Soon after completing the film, Mitchum's life took another turn as he was drafted into the United States Army. During his military service at Fort MacArthur, California, he served as a medic, showcasing a different facet of his abilities beyond the cinematic realm. At the 1946 Academy Awards, the story of G.I. Joe earned four Oscar nominations, including Mitchum's only personal nomination for Best Supporting Actor. This recognition underscored the impact of his performance in a film that resonated deeply with audiences. Mitchum's cinematic journey continued with a western, West of the Pecos, and a story centered on returning Marine veterans till the end of time. However, it was during this period that Mitchum transitioned to a genre that would come to define his career and screen persona. Robert Mitchum's legacy in the realm of cinema is held in high esteem by critics and film enthusiasts alike, with many considering him one of the finest actors of the golden age of Hollywood. Some critics go as far as to place him among the most important actors in film history, alongside iconic figures such as Cary Grant and Barbara Stanwyck. David Thompson, a respected film critic, 
hailed Mitchum as one of the three most important actors in film history. In his assessment of Mitchum's career, Thompson emphasized the actor's remarkable versatility and the breadth of his contributions to cinema. He remarked, Since the war, no American actor has made more first-class films in so many different moods. This recognition underscores Mitchum's ability to seamlessly transition between diverse genres and portray a wide range of characters with authenticity and depth. Roger Ebert, another esteemed film critic, expressed his admiration for Robert Mitchum by proclaiming him as his favorite movie star. Ebert saw Mitchum as a symbol of the enigmatic allure that defines the magic of movies. With a deep, laconic voice, a distinctive long face, and the famous weary eyes, Mitchum embodied a cinematic archetype, a character one might envision in a dimly lit saloon at closing time, waiting for a moment that could break his heart. Ebert credited Mitchum as the soul of film noir, a genre where the actor truly excelled and left an indelible mark. Despite his undeniable talent and acclaim, Robert Mitchum maintained a self-effacing and nonchalant demeanor, as exemplified in an interview with Barry Norman for the BBC. In his characteristic style, Mitchum interrupted Norman to quip, Look, I have two kinds of acting, one on a horse and one off a horse. That's it. This succinct statement encapsulated Mitchum's straightforward approach to his craft, downplaying the complexities of acting with a touch of humor. Mitchum's unpretentious attitude occasionally rubbed some of his fellow actors the wrong way. He openly expressed his puzzlement at those who considered acting a challenging and demanding profession, contributing to a reputation for nonchalance that set him apart in the Hollywood landscape. One of Mitchum's notable attributes was his photographic memory, a skill that facilitated his ability to memorize lines with relative ease. This proficiency, combined with his talent for adopting various accents, added to the depth and authenticity of his performances on screen. Director Robert Wise shared an anecdote from the shooting of Blood on the Moon, revealing Mitchum's distinctive working style. Mitchum, known for his efficiency, marked his script with the letters NAR, signifying no action required. According to Wise, Mitchum confidently asserted that he didn't need a specific line, Instead, he would convey the necessary emotion with a glance, showcasing his mastery of the craft. Mitchum's approach to acting was dismissive of method acting, a technique embraced by many of his peers. When asked by George Peppard if he had studied method acting during the filming of Home from the Hill, Mitchum responded humorously, claiming to have studied the Smirnoff method. This lighthearted remark reflected Mitchum's resistance to adopting the more introspective and immersive aspects of method acting, reinforcing his preference for a more instinctive and pragmatic approach to the art of performance. Robert Mitchum's acting style, characterized by its subtlety and understatement, faced early criticism, with some accusing him of sleepwalking through his performances. This perception of lethargy in his acting drew comments that he appeared to be disengaged or lacking energy, particularly in love scenes. James Agee, in a contemporary review of Out of the Past, remarked on Mitchum's curious languor, suggesting he seemed Bing Crosby super-saturated with barbiturates. The Monthly Film Bulletin's 1951 review of Where Danger Lives went further, describing Mitchum's performance as somnambulistic, emphasizing a sleepwalking quality to his acting. This critical sentiment persisted in the early stages of his career, contributing to an image of Mitchum as a seemingly indifferent or detached performer. However, as time went on, Mitchum's acting began to receive more nuanced evaluations. David Thompson noted that Mitchum began to attract respectable attention around the late 1950s, signaling a shift in the perception of his craft. Andrew Saris, writing for The Village Voice in 1973, challenged the earlier criticisms, asserting that Mitchum, often mistaken for having a stone face without feelings, due to his stoic on-screen presence, had been grossly maligned as an actor. Saris contended that Mitchum was, in fact, consistently reborn and recreated in each movie and relationship. 
highlighting the actor's ability to bring depth and authenticity to his roles. Robert Mitchum's standing among directors who had the privilege of working with him was consistently laudatory, attesting to his prowess as an actor and his impact on the cinematic landscape. Director William A. Wellman, reflecting on Mitchum's performance in the story of G.I. Joe, expressed strong admiration. Wellman went so far as to assert that Mitchum should have won the Academy Award for his role, considering him one of the finest, most solid, and real actors globally. This praise underscored Mitchum's ability to convey authenticity and depth in his portrayals, particularly in roles that resonated with the wartime narrative. Raoul Walsh, another esteemed director, was equally effusive in his praise of Mitchum. Walsh remembered Mitchum as one of the finest natural actors he had ever encountered. This acknowledgement spoke to Mitchum's ability to embody characters with an innate and unforced quality, a testament to his talent and the ease with which he approached his craft. Charles Lawton, who directed Mitchum in the iconic film The Night of the Hunter, held an exceptionally high regard for the actor. Lofton considered Mitchum to be among the best actors globally and even believed that he had the potential to be the greatest Macbeth. This recognition showcased Lawton's profound respect for Mitchum's talent and versatility. John Huston, a legendary director himself, positioned Mitchum among the acting elite. He believed that Mitchum belonged on the same pedestal as Marlon Brando, Richard Burton, and Laurence Olivier, emphasizing the actors standing in the pantheon of greats. Vincente Minelli, known for his work in musicals and dramas, acknowledged Mitchum's unique contributions. Minelli noted that few actors brought as much of themselves to a picture as Mitchum did, and none did it with such a total lack of affectation. This acknowledgement underscored Mitchum's ability to infuse authenticity into his roles, allowing audiences to connect with his characters on a profound level. Howard Hawks, a director known for his versatility across genres, praised Mitchum for his work ethic. While labeling Mitchum a fraud for pretending not to care about acting, Hawks recognized the actor's dedication and hard work behind the scenes. David Lean, a director renowned for epics like Lawrence of Arabia, highlighted Mitchum's mastery of stillness. Lean remarked that while other actors may act, Mitchum simply is. Mitchum's ability to bring a sense of indelible identity to the screen was noted by Lean, showcasing the actor's unique presence and impact. Robert Mitchum's impact on the acting world garnered admiration from his peers, and left an indelible mark on Hollywood. Deborah Kerr, a close friend and co-star in four films, attested to Mitchum's extraordinary talent. She remarked that his acting seemed entirely genuine, devoid of any artifice or pretense. According to Kerr, for Mitchum, acting was as effortless as falling off a log, a testament to his natural and unassuming approach to the craft. Jane Greer, who shared the screen with Mitchum in Out of the Past and The Big Steel, echoed this sentiment, stating that Mitchum would never be caught acting. He simply is. This observation underscored Mitchum's ability to embody characters with a sense of authenticity that transcended conventional acting methods. Several renowned actors, including Robert De Niro, Clint Eastwood, Michael Madsen, and Mark Rylance, have expressed their admiration for Mitchum, citing him as one of their favorite actors. Mitchum's influence extended beyond his generation, inspiring and earning the respect of actors from different eras. The American Film Institute, AFI, recognized Mitchum's enduring impact by listing him as the 23rd greatest male star of classic Hollywood cinema in their AFI's 100 Years 100 Stars ranking. A testament to Mitchum's versatility, AFI also acknowledged his performances as the menacing Max Cady and Reverend Harry Powell as the 28th and 29th greatest screen villains of all time in the AFI's 100 Years 100 Heroes and Villains list. Mitchum's contribution to popular culture extended beyond acting. 
he lent his distinctive voice to the famous American Beef Council commercials that promoted the slogan, Beef, It's What's for Dinner, from 1992 until his death. This association further solidified Mitchum's presence in the public consciousness. The connection between Mitchum and his community was evident through Mitchum's Steakhouse, which operated in Trapp, Maryland, where Mitchum and his family resided from 1959 to 1965. This establishment stood as a testament to Mitchum's influence not only in Hollywood, but also in the communities where he lived. Robert Mitchum's life came to an end on July 1, 1997 marking the conclusion of a storied career and a complex personal journey. Throughout his life, Mitchum had been a heavy smoker, and the consequences of this habit manifested in his health. He passed away peacefully in his sleep at 5 a.m. at his home in Santa Barbara, California, succumbing to complications arising from lung cancer and emphysema. At the time of his passing, his wife of 57 years, Dorothy, was by his side offering comfort in the final moments. The enduring partnership between Robert and Dorothy had weathered the highs and lows of a life in the spotlight, and Dorothy remained a constant source of support until the end. Following his death, Mitchum's body was cremated, and on July 6, 1997, a private ceremony took place to scatter his ashes into the Pacific Ocean. The ceremony held off the coast near his Santa Barbara home, was an intimate gathering attended solely by family members and his longtime friend, Jane Russell, underscoring the private nature of Mitchum's final farewell. While the ocean carried away his physical remains, a cenotaph was erected in his honor in his wife's family plot at the Odd Fellow Cemetery in Camden, Delaware. This cenotaph stands as a memorial, a symbolic connection to the place of his wife, Dorothy's roots. Tragically, Dorothy Mitchum, born on May 2, 1919, in Camden, Delaware, also reached the end of her life years later. She passed away on April 12, 2014, in Santa Barbara, California, at the age of 94. Dorothy's death marked the close of an era, leaving behind a legacy intertwined with Roberts and underscoring the enduring bond that had spanned more than half a century. What do you think about Robert Mitchum's little-known personal life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.